this week's dead horse podcast i am ashwin your host for the day and with me are my co-hosts vivek hey guys and arvind hello so today we are gonna broach the dark forest of rpgs and uh, being a very open topic that rpgs are we have identified a couple of probably very subjective topics that we want we would love to discuss among ourselves and this is the kind of thing that goes on in in banter in casual banter and we want to bring that kind of flavor into this discussion today so what we're going to discuss today is of all the rpgs that we have played over the years what character has stayed with us the most and why uh this is also a uh, a good a good time to recollect all the fun rpg moments that you have had with those characters because characters are probably the soul of every rpg that you play So I'll start off with Arvind, probably. Hmm. Ah, uh, yeah. So I have a lot of favorite RPG characters. The most of which is probably uh, the nameless one. I'm pretty sure, like, the nameless one is a like a favorite character of I uh, both of you as well. But yeah, I just like how uh, that despite of the fact that you have a lot of choices in Torment, but even then, ah, uh, you the the nameless one manages to have. his own personality and regret for his own decisions yeah i think the nameless one is probably my the most favorite character in an rpg so what what stuck out the most about him in this one incidentally you've just grabbed my choice too so i'm wondering <laughs> if i think of another one <laughs> <laughs> while i listen to you guys but what stood out the most about the nameless one He's a very celebrity. Uh, yeah, like, yeah. What I liked about it, like him, is his that, uh, like even with his, um, with all the stuff that he had done, and and what all stuff the player does in the game, even then he has a certain personality. He has his own regrets, and and I like the way, uh, in some cases, the game manages to manipulate your death. I remember at one stage, uh, you have to. Uh, kill yourself to get into a mortuary or a graveyard or something i don't remember that particularly well but yeah like that game had a lot of good moments excellent people we have just been joined by another of our host tejas welcome tejas hey so tejas we have been discussing about our favorite rpg characters of all time so you be uh-huh. an avid writer reader and rpg player who sticks out the most in your memory Okay um I may have to correct the avid RPG player bit because as much as I love the genre uh I haven't really played completely through that many RPGs not as many as I'd like so uh from the limited pool that I have played I believe what I would uh what I'd say is uh it probably be Mission and Zalbar from uh, Knights of the Old Republic cuz like I said I've played probably the first uh two planets of kotor at least four to five times over but i've never really managed to progress beyond that for a variety of reasons and so those two really stick out to me and i don't know why i think i just kind of like the character so do you are there any fun moments that you remember with these characters what made them so memorable how they interacted with other characters anything that you can recollect a short notice I I just generally liked uh their shorter story arc and uh or at least what they have in the beginning and you have a wookie as a companion which is something you've always wanted uh ever since watching the old trilogy so that was a major draw for those uh for those two characters for me but apart from that I don't really have like a very, a stand out uh, character from any of the games I've played that I could say was like yes this guy was definitely my favorite What's interesting is that I don't remember these characters at all from Kotor. How about no? How about, not really. How about Vivek Arvind? How about you guys? Mm, I don't uh, really remember any particular Kotor characters here. Yeah. Neither do I. Like my favorite character from a Star Wars game is Jaden Kaur from Star Wars Jedi Knight Jedi Academy. That is my I think that is the best lightsaber combat game made to date, and that is the best Star Wars RPG 
also made to date because playing it is more fun than playing Kotor. Just, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> that's just that's wanna... quite possible. Draw your uh, attention. The, the the thing is, something that one of us found so so personal and identifiable is is completely off the of the frequency of the rest of us. It's interesting, isn't it? So it is. I mean, what did you? Uh, what character sticks out the most from uh, Kotor to you? Well, I think I found the characters of Kotor too much more memorable than Kotor. I, oh. I remember Kreia, HK47. Of course, all of us are worshippers at the altar of Chris Avalon, so that's, you know, it's understandable. Yeah, no, I, I actually, like, uh, I remember more Mass Effect characters, probably because I played it more recently than I remember yeah. Kotor characters. But I still remember the, the, uh, the bot, the... Uh, the bot from Kotor 2, I think, is much better than anything, any other character even in Kotor 1. Oh, yes, HK47. Yes, HK47. Uh, yeah. I do remember, uh, like, awesome. I don't really remember his name, but I remember the the master from uh, Jade Empire. Yeah, that you know, guy's the... twist was well set up. Oh, yeah, that, that was an epic betrayal. That moment of, like, I almost picked him. I almost picked the master from Jade Empire because that betrayal moment is really epic. Uh, when he kind of like just gives you the kick and like uh, he completely destroys you and walks away, he mm-hmm. does a really good job of uh, like you know kicking the shit out of you. That sort of moment, um, when you speak of the, that sort of moments, I also remember the the big revelation in Kotor, where where you find out you're Revan. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Spoilers for those who haven't played Kotor, you're Revan. Yeah. yeah. At at this point, I think it's common knowledge that you're Revan. There's no so way. the guy who hasn't played Bioshock, Bioshock Two, or Bioshock Infinite, which we can't spoil because he's here. Who's here? You're here, they just. I know how they all end. <laughs> they all die. So. <laughs> I'm like, which, so yeah, you're done. Well, okay. So my favorite character is. There's very little narrative kind of element associated with the character. It's a Diablo 2 Paladin (laughs) is my favorite character. I'll tell you a very specific anecdote associated with this. Uh, So I used to play Diablo 2 in a net cafe. I used to play as a barbarian. My friend used to play as a paladin. We were playing for around four hours. Uh, It was a four hour session. We were doing a loot run with the ancients and we had died, I think. I think we had died every time we tried because the Ancients is a really tough battle and we were at level 70, each of us. So, <laughs> we were super tired and I, I think I had like 100 health left and uh, he had uh, just a little bit more than I did and I was uh, I was about to die when he like used this ability that Paladins have and uh, he healed me and what ended up happening was I used Whirlwind, killed the last Ancient and we won. And the scream both of us let out uh, because he had just died, but I had won and we'd beaten the battle for the first time, I think, at that difficulty. We were on the hardest difficulty in Diablo 2. So we, I think that uh, was epic. Yeah, that's like, I don't know. There are certain memories associated with experiences you have when you're playing that are stronger than anything that uh, a writer can write sometimes, even though I have characters from RPGs that I really, really like. Which, which is a separate thing, but this is associated with like uh, this. I, I like my friend's paladin character because he saved our asses and we were able to get through a fight that was really irritating us for a long time. <laughs> Many times, uh, the best memories are the are the most personal ones, aren't they? I'm sure all of us have similar memories, which being the old men that we are can't recollect right now. <laughs> but, so since Arvind has usurped my character, the nameless one. <laughs> <laughs> think of somebody else. Improvising, I think I'll come up with either Dacon or probably Geralt. Ooh, I'll just nice. Dacon because he's the less well-known of the two. So the good thing about Dacon is how uh, the character progression is handled in that game. Where if you, anybody who has played Planescape probably remembers how the unbroken circles of Zerthimon are revealed one by one throughout the game. And you see how a man's faith is fundamentally changed through his progression. I think that's one of the best examples of 
dealing with faith in a game uh, and showing how you go through different phases in your faith and end up somewhere completely different from where your faith started out. And purely for that reason and some of his quotes, I think I'll pick Dacron to be my most memorable RPG character. But on or on this note, before we close this off, any of you guys, can you think of when you think of your favorite characters or even non-favorite characters, what would you have done to add extra dimensions to them? Like, have you ever thought, hey, this person, he or she would be cooler if they had this kind of a, a trait to them? Like, instead of being all goody-goody, maybe they could have been a little deceptive, a little more self-centered, or vice versa. Have you ever thought of a character like that in an RPG? This is an open question. Uh, Who wants to go? They just, yeah. Yeah, oh, okay, well, I've thought of that quite often, and it's not just uh, in uh, in an RPG, but generally, like, any game character I've come across, even uh, even uh, when I'm watching a TV show or a book, it, it's it, it's nice to, uh, you know, think about what else the character could have done and why, but in games in particular... Um, you know, I think one of the one of the characters that I I would uh, have liked to see do something different would have been uh, Jim Ray- Rayner in uh, StarCraft Two. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know. I've talked about I've talked about this one with Vivek, and so he knows where this is going. But um, at length. yes, at length. But in okay, I'll, I'll give you the brief version. It basically doesn't make sense. Uh, the way he's all mopey about Kerrigan in the beginning, and the decisions he takes, especially you know closer to the end of that, uh, at least uh, to the end of uh, uh, Wings of Liberty, it's it it just isn't quite the same as what you remember him uh, from the beginning uh, from StarCraft and StarCraft Brood War. Uh, you'd expect him to have kind of reconciled with the fact that, you know, uh, she's different. And yes, he would have, in some subtler way, tried to, you know, keep her safe, but not so overtly as he does in uh, Wings of Liberty. So there's more to that. There's probably like a whole spectrum of uh, little story changes that don't make sense. But I think, you know, the crux of it would have been that everything in Wings of Liberty and thereafter is very overt and I won't say that, you know, StarCraft and Brood War were, you know, epically subtle or anything, but they did manage a certain level of subtlety and also uh, a lot of uh, good uh, narrative moments through uh, through the gameplay that I didn't find, personally at least, in uh, Wings of Liberty or Hearts of the Swarm. I don't see why Blizzard have to be subtle. I mean, they're not running for president, are they? So... Oh, God. Was that the segue moment? No, it's not. It's not a segue moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's a moment where we all sigh because Arvind likes puns so much. It wasn't a pun. Like this wasn't a pun. This was you, just a no. Sort you were making love to that pun at that point. I, I would use coarser no, language. It's not, it's a, a pun is like like if you modify a certain word to uh, like make it sound like another. You this made a, actually just you know, you it. made a pun. You just you did accept it and move on. No, but you're wrong. Like that's not a pun. Like, you use that just... reference. You use that reference in a. Funny, yeah. right? If Arvind makes a joke, let's just, just, just agree that that's the rule. Okay. Yeah, that's our dose of fun. So, what about Arvind? Uh, do you, did you do you have a character in mind who you would? No, I don't think like the characters I like are usually because like they are so well written and they have rounded personalities and such. So I don't think I could actually improve any character. That's, a, that's okay. Rant about Mass Effect too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, in, yeah, Mass Effect's the se- yeah series has a lot of uh, like characters which I don't find very likable. But yeah, like one character which like I would just like to uh, discuss is that like the character of Geralt in Witcher, like the the like he has a lot of depth and he does a lot of interesting things. But somehow I just don't like the character. Like I can sort of appreciate at a distance how the character is written and what, but but, but I just can't bring myself to like Geralt. For some reason, uh, actually, that sounds like a triumph for the designers, if you ask me. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. But yeah, like, I'm not sure how I'll, yeah, because it's almost like that. That's what they were aiming for. But yeah, makes sense. Uh, Vivek, how about you? Uh, I think I, the only character I'd kind of change is from Mass Effect. 
uh, I I'd have kept Saren alive and kept him as the main villain for all three games. Hmm. Okay. So that's what I did. How how do you so suppose you you had this in your power, like Casey Hudson drops okay. people and you get to keep Saren in two and three. What like he would become stale if he stayed the same way, right? After Mass Effect. No, no, he'd have to evolve as a villain, right? right. I how think his I think his goals would have to change. Like he has to get, he has to keep digging, right? Like in that hole. Once you're in that hole, you have to keep digging. So, you know, I think it. I think like it'd be interesting when when a, a Reaper War starts. I would have started that Reaper War earlier because the second game is just build up and it's not very good at building up. I would have started that Reaper War in the second game and I'd have had Sarin commit those genocides on those planets and slowly, like I think I don't know, watch him change into you know someone who just yeah, just yeah. justifies doing worse and worse things because. I'm killing a billion people, but I'm saving, you know, I'm saving the future of all sentient species or all Turians at least, you know. So, uh, in that sense, I would have kept him alive because as a villain, that makes him more compelling and it makes him even sympathetic because he has a motivation other than wah ha 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 star child and this is what we do all the time. You know? I think that like an interesting thing is that like it's generally agreed that Mass Effect Two's entire plot was sort of a diversion and like. What what that ended up doing was that Mass Effect Three had to do the like it had to yeah it had to shoulder the burden of Mass Effect Two as well in which the conflict should have intensified and the resolution so it had to like shoehorn two games worth of uh, conflict and resolution in one but yeah like I I don't actually like Saren the way it was resolved was good but I would have like just asked for a better written villain like other than Wah elusive man who like is a total like jerk See, some... actually they they had potential even with the elusive man of making him someone like making him a saren like figure but just in favor of humanity you know someone who's willing to let other species die so that humanity can survive you know yeah yeah but the problem is that like cerebrus and the whole thing was just so badly yeah, handled yeah. but yeah Cer- Cer- cerberus i think i don't know that that was not uh, they start out as a pretty like straight up mahaha evil organization as opposed to we are kind of murky in the way our morality works we're yeah. not straight up good or bad uh, that was weird the other thing i think is this is not favorite character but when you guys were talking i couldn't help but think what if uh, what if obsidian had made dragon age 2 you guys <laughs> <laughs> that it would have been entirely different yeah like but, uh, let's just like uh, like take this one step forward and what if obsidian would have made every game ever instead of like, let's get Obsidian to make Modern Warfare 5, for example. But then what if Obsidian made Ashes Cricket? <laughs> oh, I'm wow. pretty sure it would it would contain a lot of uh, like locker room politics and lots of BCCI politics and stuff like that. <laughs> okay. I'm I sure it would. Imagine what I've done with Kevin Peterson's character. <laughs> <laughs> Srinivasan, I can't, I can't imagine. Like, I think there has to be a mission in which you sneak into Srinivasan's office and plant a bug. <laughs> yeah, and then like when you're sneaking out, somebody's like, "Hey, Sachin, what's up?" Then you're like, "Oh, <laughs> oh, no, shit! Oh, okay, holy shit! Wait a minute, Sachin is the mole." Yeah, I'm just saying. Sachin, the undercover. So basically, the cricket game that. <laughs> Obsidian would make is is sleeping dogs with Sachin as Weishen. I was actually thinking Alpha Protocol with Sachin as uh, Thornton. Yes. Yeah. But that works. That works. Alpha Protocol is. Yeah. But we Alpha need Protocol a good has to be a voice voiceover actor. Sachin's voice won't do previously. Nolan North can do it. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh yes, I was about to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Like I was just saying okay. that I love that in Saints Row 4 there is an option to have your either male or female character be then there's a separate voice option for Nolan North. See, I just like that. It should be a mod in the <laughs> game which has like every character voiced by Nolan North. They just you were uh, saying. Yeah, uh, the question I had was, uh, the, what would you prefer uh, in any sort of media to see the villain kind of develop? over uh, over the span of the series as compared to starting out as a villain you know which would you prefer then you know we were talking about Saren and all and even uh, you have the same case with Kerrigan in Starcraft where you kind of see them transform from you know even ambiguous to mildly evil to more evil or but you know would you prefer to see it grow 
as a villain and become more and more entrenched in whatever they believe and more personally i feel it's all about understanding the motivations of a character so i can i can i find a villain more scary when they are more identifiable and when i understand the motivations otherwise it's just a, a cardboard cutout isn't it like yeah. you like said it's just when i can laugh to a time and there's no substance beneath it but but when you see that when you see that he or she is somebody like like you then they're much more scary that's what i feel yeah definitely in fact that's one thing which i liked about uh, planescape torment is that you were your own uh, kind of uh, villain in a way like because everything that you did was coming back to haunt you so i, I like that part because it was different from the usual villain who's like who's often does something that doesn't really make sense and like usually a villain is just there to uh, impede the path of a of a heroic character but in that case i like that like your previous and wrong doings were coming back to haunt you on top of that you were not saving the world you were just trying to save yourself so it fit perfectly yeah. into that arc yeah i like how that um, like your character evolves like and at the start you are pretty much like uh, whatever like i just need to get out of this cycle of uh, amnesia and dying and regret and stuff like that but as like slowly you try to evolve your character evolves like and it's visible like commander shepherd doesn't really like at least in my sense like if you play like the commander shepherd shepherd if you're playing like paragon or renegade he just stays the same for the three series he's just oh, wow, wow, i'm going to punch reporters and stuff so i don't think like the character genuinely evolves and like that's one thing which like the player player character legitimately involving that's not a thing that enough enough role playing games have like, in fact mostly classical rpgs tend to do this better then but uh, do you think this is something that could have been done uniquely only by planescape torment because yeah definitely have... planescape did it better than most yeah no, but could uh, i like it to any because, other game i mean no no what i mean is could, could any other game have done it at all because planescape had the luxury of having multiple incarnations in your past your back story was very malleable on the other hand for shepherd you have a fixed back story and the present or are you saying that depending on your actions in game your back story is revealed in a different fashion no i think like the problem with uh, mass effect and rpgs in the general mold is that uh, like if you constrain yourself to a morality system then your character ultimately has a very little room to evolve because if you always have okay i'm going to do this is the good option this is the neutral option this is the bad option then what really happens is that your if any usual player who's playing will either go good or bad 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 or sometimes good sometimes neutral and maybe a couple of bad options if they feel like it so that it takes away the room for for a player to actually like for a character to evolve in themselves because that's what uh, that's it's a very hard balance to maintain like on the on one hand a player has a as a input to the character's every decision but on the other hand as a writer you also want the character to evolve on their own so if you try to systemize uh, di- uh, your dialogue choices and your the choices you make in game so that i think ends up limiting especially if you try to align them in a good evil neutral axis so i think any game that's without a, a very rigid morality axis tends to perform much better in that regard i see what you mean because uh, midway through mass effect series i found myself not even thinking about dialogue choices i knew top right would be good and bottom right would be bad paragon yeah. yeah yeah i think bottom right is like it's just red or blue and the, by the end of the game you're just uh, like automatically navigating to red or blue but uh, i think the that mass effect it definitely it's one of the few series in which you do feel like you've had an impact on the world like you see the world changing because of the choices you've made through the course of those three games so it does yeah, feel I like our actually... actions have had have had a consequences on that world but I, i i think that it's just that the consequences feel very like arvin puts it binary they're not always as satisfying as you'd like them to be uh i actually think mass effect 1 was way better in terms of that because uh, in 3 especially like uh, if if somebody else died uh, an identical character stepped forward and in, in their place so i think 3 actually ruined that feeling of you actually having an effect on the world but yeah other other than that i agree with you 
like i wouldn't really hold mass effect as a like paragon of for uh, your changes having visible effects on the game world no I it's think, not it's not yeah. it's not a, the best example of that but it is a game in which that like i think it's a game in which that happens and they handle it kind of well it and it, it but the the end result is not as good as it should be considering it's a game all about choices and dialogue I'd say the witcher series probably handles this way better than the mass effect series oh, both witcher no, 1 and 2 there's no comparison witcher 1 and 2 are are better games than all three mass effect games put together at this point hmm. uh, at least according to me according to me i i, I don't know what uh, ashwin thinks or what yes. sages thinks In, in, in respect to this particular thing of your actions of uh, changing the world, I thought the Witcher one had a much better way of handling this, especially because it had, it had a very open world feel to it. I remember yeah. halfway through the game when you decide to team up with either the Squirtail or the humans, uh, you could see the world change in visible ways. I, I it really came across in the in the, in the game. Yeah, I also think that uh, interestingly, like. Uh, the witcher 2 the cho- well the choices in the witcher 2 feel a lot they feel a lot larger right yes. they don't feel as personal as the choices in the witcher 1 exactly uh, which is why you feel a little bit dissociated from them but I, I, then again i think they sold that to me by making it feel like geralt is not no longer just another person in this world he's he's a pretty special character because there aren't many people like him left so it kind of made sense that jared could be involved in these kind of really really important big events you know but uh, i could fully appreciate this only after i did two playthroughs of the witcher 2 take yeah. both and then you yeah. could see how the world how your actions actually change the world the other part of the world that you could not see yeah Whereas absolutely yeah. but i think i think that's a great thing that they did they made that choice really matter the choice at the end of act 1 defines how the The rest of the game plays for you, and and that is amazing, you know. In terms of making extra content, it's it's a pretty big uh, undertaking. Yeah. It's a huge challenge, yes. Yeah. Like any RPG is. Just just an honorable mention. Uh, the cheetah coat wearing guy from Yakuza 3 is one of my favorite characters in an RPG. <laughs> Because he drives a truck through the gates of the Japanese parliament to pick you up when you're fighting all the bodyguards outside the Japanese parliament. I second wow. that. I think he's the T Rajinder of video games. <laughs> no, he's the captain of video games. Well, on that note, I think we we'll move on to the we we'll move on from the 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 deep gorge that is RPGs that will suck in all of our time to our new section. We are gonna we are gonna talk a little about games, big games, introducing microtransactions in them. I remember reading uh, Rice. Rise, Son of Rome's review, and how it complained that you actually had could pay for making your experience a little bit easier inside a game. So we would like to hear your thoughts on this. We'll go around the table. Tell us what do you think of games where you have to pay a bucket full of money, but still have the option of making transactions inside it. Yeah, not a fan at all. Like straight up, don't don't appreciate that. And I I read an article uh, that kind of expanded on this and said that micro uh, Microsoft has kind of approached this whole uh, this whole aspect of uh, microtransactions wrong. They've I believe they've done it with Forza as well, where they've you know uh, released the game at sixty dollars, but hey, for an extra three or four, you get a new car and a new track or so on and so forth. And you know it 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 just basically shows a lack of understanding of you know um w- how microtransactions should properly work um a lot of uh, uh mobile games are doing it right uh, right now like from uh Dota to League of Legends to Smite it's you know they give you the basic game for free and then the microtransactions are for you know vanity items generally not something that gives you direct power and i i believe microsoft has totally failed to you know see this okay so i guess you're not a fan of this then we'll yeah, last no. <laughs> so we'll yeah, i on the other hand am an absolute fan of giving corporations my money for no reason at all so <laughs> yeah so i i put a straight question to you right would you buy a game if it had micro transactions and you still had to pay 60 dollars simple no <laughs> it was fun 
if it was a fun game i'd buy it okay so you're not so you would just opt out of the microtransactions bit i suppose and play it like any other yeah, game i i'd play without ever using the microtransaction stuff like mass effect 3 has microtransactions if you want to buy booster packs and stuff for the multiplayer but i never bought this one so uh, what of the, the 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 designers have already rigged the game so that, that you cannot have the most fun you can have without microtransactions uh, in that case i think it like it probably becomes a thing of how much time i'm willing to put into it right i might put some time into it and then just say okay this is this was a waste of my money and opt out uh i hope like it it looks more and more that uh, a lot of triple a trends are are gravitating towards doing what the mobile space has uh, kind of latched on to uh, without really realizing why it works so well in the mobile space and that the mobile space is aimed at a completely different kind of consumer than the triple a games are aiming at I I don't think they realize that the overlap between those two audiences is very very little. The kind of people who play AAA games and the kind of people that play mobile games, they're very different uh, generally. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. So it's, uh, it's not the best decision according to me, and obviously I don't like it. But uh, I think it's going to affect the way video games are made and sold in a pretty dramatic way if, if this is a trend that takes hold seriously. You know. Okay. In, in the console space, you think it's a question of knowing an audience, isn't it? I think it's a question of, yeah, I think it's a question of knowing the audience you're selling your games to, and I don't think there is an audience for that kind of stuff on consoles right now. Okay, so let's ex- extrapolate this into the PC segment and ask Arvind this question. Arvind, I'll I'll, I'll make this a little more difficult for you. Suppose mm-hmm. you were designing a game like you're doing now, and you thought. Mm-hmm. Microtransactions actually made sense in that game. Truly, honestly, as a game designer, you felt that is the best way this game could be played. Would you would you still go ahead make a full price game and put microtransactions in or not for the PC? Mm. Okay, so from a technical standpoint, at the moment, I don't have the know how to implement microtransactions. But assuming that I can somehow learn that, like the dark arts. Uh, <laughs> i don't know like if if i somehow stumble upon a game design that like somehow like magically becomes better if i include microtransactions and like if i can implement them and apparently if people like them then yeah i guess more money for me but i don't think it's possible like because the problem here is that if you have on on one hand if you have a game that you know that you buy and okay that's the point at which it ends the after that it's it's up to the game to engage you but on the other hand if you are viewing your game as a continued revenue stream and that that kind of becomes like a, a whole bargaining into into itself like if i'm playing with a game with in which i know there there aren't going to be microtransactions and like the designer has done all they can to uh, make the game fun and on the other hand i'm 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 always constantly engaged in a battle of wits i'm thinking hmm is does the game want me to pay more for this thing does the game want me to pay more for more for that thing it it inherently becomes less fun because spending money like no matter what corporations want you to believe is not a fun activity like it's an activity which which makes you think about oh wait a minute will i have enough money to pay off rent mera bijli ka bill to nahi matlab won't go unpaid and stuff like that so i don't see how like but yeah like i don't know i'm i'm like very against this kind of thing so i don't think i would actually uh, stumble upon a design that actually you know while you were talking i i just had an idea you know last week we were talking about that politic political game you'd make as a satire <laughs> uh, what if oh, in yeah. that to advance you had to pay bribe money to the developers oh <laughs> oh man <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that might actually yeah that would yeah it would achieve the aim of making the player hate the developer and the political parties involved and everything <laughs> yeah well, it, that's for sure it gets the message across of satire i suppose mm, yeah it's it's very crap satire actually but has to rely on actually taking your money from you to make you feel bad what because is, i can okay. just like show up at your door and punch you in the balls and say <laughs> hey give me money you'll feel bad that way i don't have to make a political satire game 
to make you feel bad by asking you money for money so i yeah, like it's it's very bad satire but i guess it sort of makes sense in a twisted way well it's, 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 yeah yeah i mean i think yeah that's what i'm going to do i'm going to make a game that satirizes capitalism by straight up engaging in the same exploitative capitalist practices which i'm satirizing so yeah i think what that is- would send a very strong message no i mean like if you're making a game that's about how asking for money and stuff is bad and then you are doing the same thing by asking for money that kind of <laughs> undermines your whole thing right it's like if i'm i on one hand say hey look these politicians are bad because they keep asking you for money and stuff as bribes and then i'm like hey but hey why don't you buy the, the dlc in my game that's totally not a bribe so well no i'm not yeah. i'm not talking about buying it by 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 by, by a dlc or something I, i don't know what i was thinking of was more specific as opposed to like even bribing the developers what if it was a multiplayer game in which you were playing with other players and all of you are competing for seats or like you know you can play together what if you can bribe other players who are popular to get into their uh-huh. party you know oh wow you know so that's that like would, if they added uh... that would definitely encourage all the botting and stuff like that which happens <laughs> yeah it would yeah. be a nightmare yeah a mech warrior game where like uh, if to buy a mech you have to pay the actual price it would take to build such a mech <laughs> <laughs> so, so mech would cost like 50 million dollars 1 billion dollars for the big ones <laughs> so basically there would only be like you know four or five mechs in the whole game <laughs> yeah that would en- reinforce how re- how difficult it is to make a mech build a mech okay yeah then it really wouldn't be mech warrior though it kind of be something like you know wasteland warrior <laughs> well, or something no, it would really be mech warrior at that point because there'd be only one mech in the whole game. Yeah. Uh, lots of interesting crazy thoughts there guys we never at a big yeah i have a that. feeling all of us won't become very good at free to play designers in an instant yeah I, i don't i don't think any of us understands the concept behind it well enough to implement it in a game yeah. uh, ashwin you're yes. the only one who's working in mobile game design right now you should <laughs> have a lot to say about this actually <laughs> well i was going to say that yeah the my previous employer Uh, the three months that I spent there, long three months, were entirely <laughs> for doing microtransactions. I had all the technical know-how on doing all these microtransactions and ad, uh, ad-directed revenue generation and stuff like that. Wow, that's the dark side of gaming, anyway. Yeah, yeah. And I, I have first-hand experience of how designers would think first about gaming the game and getting the money out of it. So. It's I don't think of, you can call these people designers anymore. I wouldn't blame them entirely. It's just what the the, the system asks of them. So yes, lots of interesting crazy things. No, thoughts but uh, Ashwin, what do you think about microtransactions in in big games and mobile games? You haven't, you haven't said anything about that. Well, my stand is pretty clear. If the game has microtransactions and I can't have full fun out of it without paying money, I will not buy it. Okay. So I think it's. Me and Tejas are on the same board. Yeah, I think but that's what. Uh, yeah, yeah. I I would buy a game with microtransactions if I could have fun without you know ever paying that extra money. Then the debate goes on into whether DLCs are microtransactions. I don't think they are. I don't count the any extra content, any extra levels that you're adding to a game is not microtransactions. Yeah, but what about reports that say that the content was already there, but it was just locked down? Ah, uh, it's. I, yeah, I don't know. If it's ca- if it's a Capcom game, maybe you have a good case. But otherwise, I I would not. Uh, fans always think that uh, content is already on disc and is <coughs> not always true. People make a lot of content is made post release. A lot of lot of perception. It's a very. That's usually why, like, for the games who have like fifty billion pieces of DLC, I tend to wait for the game of the year edition. Otherwise, yeah. I don't really buy them at all. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Especially when there's a lot of piddly DLC like you know, uh, horse armor. <laughs> yeah. Oh well. So we we'll move on to the next segment which is where we talk about what we've been doing all this week. So Arvind, what have you been up to? How is Anvis coming along? Mm, yeah, I've I've we've moved, I, I'm currently working on uh, the world map stuff and it's it's a lot of tedious ui work mostly but yeah it's, it's in the polish phase uh and yeah uh, in other developments uh, we are also going to egx rest 
that's a convention in i think birmingham uk yeah so yeah, we are also going there and we, we we will go with a build of unrest to show off and stuff that's awesome. and apart from that yeah we also uh, and like announced a new logo for unrest where well, i guess that's we removed the old logo everyone hated <laughs> the new one does look good though i've seen it yeah thanks <laughs> hey, where's the, where's the new logo yeah, it's on my site and yeah it's on it's everywhere like wherever you find your usual daily dose of unrest thing daily that's, dose of that's unrest <laughs> that would be my office yes <laughs> oh okay i've seen this logo it's not a new logo it's been around for a while right oh yeah yeah you are yeah you are actually uh, like one of those people who uh, like hipsters basically you you have the cool news ahead of usual oh sketch. go to hell man i'm not you oh you made me a hipster <laughs> uh, no, i think yeah like the earlier the discussion about becoming the thing you hate applies to this <laughs> with an excellent groan we move on to vivek vivek what have you been up to uh well almost like all the technical work i was doing on uh, graveyard is is finished i'm working on the tutorial level it should be done by end of december so uh, all three of you will be getting a playable new year's first week i think yeah yeah nice the tutorial level is coming along well it's basically just uh you know planning out like the first first time you know for you it's your first playable so i want it to be as simple as possible while introducing all the cool stuff you know as quickly yeah. as possible Uh, the thing the hat basically talking talking out levels and stuff right yeah ashwin yeah the, the tip of the hat to when uh, yeah. i ask if you are doing the baby watch oh god yeah I, i actually think vague that you should make a website and some kind of landing page for your game because uh, i'm sure we have thousands of listeners from around the world and they won't know whatever the <laughs> hell you are talking about <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah like you should make a yeah, yeah you should make a like landing page and stuff this and, and i am guaranteeing you no one is going to come to the end of this podcast to listen to what we've been working on all week <laughs> <laughs> no but yeah like i'm just saying in general like to like promote your game and like have pre- like start getting people and press interested and stuff like that because yeah, i'm pretty yeah, sure but... there are a lot of people who are looking for a good stealth game right now so the force coming out man Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. uh no 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 don't play thief 4 it sucks guys you should play graveyard of thieves it's my game it'll be out next year sometime uh and yeah i'm working on a website but work on that is is pro- progressing uh, at not an optimal pace right now but yeah i should finish that and i have a website up soon with dev videos and dev diaries and all that uh, all that stuff yeah we all be looking forward to that yes and <laughs> i'm sure you will Of course, of course, yes. And uh, us includes all our twenty thousand and forty-five viewers, right, guys? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Our over nine thousand viewers. Uh-huh. Uh, which reminds me, uh, Vivek, what happened to that script? Which was supposed to automatically refresh our YouTube page and increase our views? Is that ready yet? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's it, it's going live. Bang! Now I, I press the big red button. <laughs> we have over over 9000 viewers like everyone's everyone's watching us and soon we're, we're going to become youtube sensations because of the number of hits we got yeah <laughs> we will be on the front page it's it's not like it, it's not like just five guys from lick dev listening to this i bet you it's like the whole world man <laughs> speaking of which uh, tejas how's the book coming along tejas is writing a book for no one else who knows Uh yeah it's it's coming along pretty good actually I'm uh for uh, those of you uh who I haven't told already there's the uh uh there's the National Novel Writing Month uh, competition in November so I'm basically a few thousand words away from hitting my goal and it's uh, turning out really damn good actually I I probably should talk about it more in detail at some point but maybe not now until I'll, I'll wait till I finish It's a fantasy book just so you know he's not writing non fiction. Yeah. Yeah, I I can't do non fiction. That's good to hear yes. So we have a couple of game designers and a writer. <laughs> yes. We have all the right ingredients in this podcast. 
So <laughs> on that note, uh, we it was good to have all of you twenty five thousand people here. We <laughs> are signing off. Vivek. Yeah. See you guys. Arvin. Bye. Tejas. Hey, goodbye, everybody. And it's me, Ashwin. Good night. To listen to the last twenty minutes of this podcast, you must pay us one dollar. All right. <laughs>